Truth Espresso, episode 39. Face it, we all would rather sleep in this morning. <sighs> That's why God gave us espresso, to kickstart our zombified corpses into hyperdrive. <laughs> and now, giving your mind and soul the morning shot of truth it craves. <sighs> this is Truth Espresso with Daniel Minnick. The Bible talks a lot about money, but does the Bible tell us how God expects money to be defined and used? Does God address the question of manipulating money to rob people of their wealth? Hello, this is Daniel Minnick, and welcome to Truth Espresso. I hope you are having an excellent day, and this is episode 38, God's Money versus the Manipulators. In this episode, we're going to take a little tour through some passages in the Bible to see what God's attitude toward money as a whole is. We're not really going to talk about financial planning or saving a few bucks here and there or, you know, personal finance. We're not going to be talking about budgeting or how to get out of debt or anything like that. That's not what this topic is going to be about concerning money. No, this is going to be a discussion about macroeconomics and how the Bible views how money should be used and represented in an economy. And so when God defines an economy, especially in relation to the nation of Israel, the people whom God called out of the nations, how did God define the money for that nation, and did he have good reasons for that? So I want to look at a few points from the Bible that I have outlined and summarized to see how God relates to money in the Word of God. I apologize that my voice might sound a little weak in this episode. I am getting over being under the weather, but nothing too bad that keeps me from making an episode of Truth Espresso. So, number one point, God created the money. Now, if we're used to using those green pieces of paper, like in the United States of America, we look at that, and although it says on that green dollar bill, in God we trust, we might wonder how relevant that saying is to today. Because if we really trust in God, we really should trust in the Word of God and how the Word of God defines money. So if we trusted in God, can we trust that God is good enough to tell us about money? And when I say God created the money, we might look at that piece of paper and say, well, God didn't really create this. I mean, he created the plants, he created the trees, the seeds that grow into trees, and then we as humans chop down the trees and use the wood in uh, paper mills to make paper, and then we have printing presses that we uh, assembled and ink that we've refined, and we print these green pieces of paper, and that's money, so... Why would I say that God created the money? Well, when we look at money in the Bible, we see that there is an awful lot of gold and silver. Now, granted, there were no printing presses in the time of the Bible, so people couldn't make paper money. But that doesn't mean that economies during the Bible times didn't suffer from some of the same effects as we today might suffer through money churning out of a printing press, the idea of fiat money and how it can inflate the currency. So people have had this kind of delusion of money, this inflation of money, even in the past, even before there was such a thing as paper money. And so God created the money. Let's look at Genesis chapter 2 and verse 12. 
And this is way back at the beginning of the creation. Genesis chapter 1 talks about how God created everything in six days, and then he created male and female, and he gave them dominion over the earth, and then he rested on the seventh day. And then Genesis chapter 2 talks about some of the things that were created at some of the land features and the rivers that were around at that time during the Garden of Eden. So this is fresh from the mind of God, fresh from the creative hand of God. Genesis 2 and verse 12 says, And the gold of that land is good. There is bdellium and the onyx stone. So the gold of that land is good. So we could see that at the creation, God created gold and God created gold to be good. And we see that gold very early on during the time of the Bible was used as money. And so it seems that God actually planted into the ground. God actually planted deep into the earth substances, metals such as gold and silver to be mined and used as money. And we mentioned on the last episode some of the uses for gold and silver and that what makes a good money is something that not only can be used as a medium of exchange, that it's fungible and divisible and stuff like that, but that it actually has utility in and of itself to be used as a good, as a product. And gold and silver can be used as jewelry. They're shiny and beautiful, but they also have other uses in industry and so on. And so it seems that God actually created what he wanted people to use as money right from the start. And so God supplied the money. He didn't expect human beings to create something out of nothing, such as Um, a paper money that is not backed by anything that God created. So God created the dirt for growing plants. God created trees for food and fruit. God created metals to be used for creating tools and machinery. And God created gold and silver to be used as money. It seems pretty clear in the Bible That right from the creation, God created money. And so that was point number one. God created the money. Money requires no human wizards to devise or control the supply. God himself created money in the earth to be extracted and used honestly. So God created the money. And number two, God measured the money. Or God weighed the money. Let's go to Exodus chapter 30 and verse 13. Quote, This they shall give every one that passeth among them that are numbered half a shekel after the shekel of the sanctuary. A shekel is twenty geras, and half shekel shall be the offering of the Lord. And so for Israel, God actually designated a particular weight of silver that was called the shekel, and it was the shekel of the sanctuary, and that was specified to be 20 geras, and a gera is a particular small weight. Now, I'm not saying that to be biblical, we in the United States of America must go back to using a specific weight of silver called a shekel. We don't have to use a shekel to be biblical, but notice that God designated a particular weight. In other words, God wants money honestly to be used as a particular weight of a metal that he has designated to be money. And so gold and silver should be used as money and a particular weight of gold and silver, which would mean that they should be pure. I mean, you can't take something that's half silver and half tin that weighs one shekel and expect it to be traded as the the same value of a shekel's weight of silver. Money historically and naturally represented a unit of weight 
of a precious metal. So just as in Bible times, even up until not too long ago, when we look at the grand scheme of history, money has always been a weight of some kind of reliable good, such as gold and silver. Now, for an example of this, if you are familiar with the U.S. dollar, did you know that the U.S. dollar was not just some kind of piece of paper? The U.S. dollar used to be a silver unit. The U.S. dollar used to be defined as a certain weight in silver. So, how does this work? Well, the word dollar actually comes originally from the word thaler. That's kind of interesting. It sounds pretty similar. So, where did the word thaler come from? Well, there was a town in the kingdom of Bohemia, and we might recognize where Bohemia is by recognizing what it is now. It is called the Czech Republic. Now, when I was a kid growing up, there was actually a country called Czechoslovakia, and before the Czech Republic and Slovakia split. But in this kingdom of Bohemia, there was a town called Joachimsthal, or it means the valley of Joachim. Thal means valley or vale. And think of, you know, the word Dale. You know, we, we have some towns in the United States that are something Dale. And Dale actually means valley. And so, what would Thaler mean? So, if Thal is valley, then Thaler would mean something or someone from the valley. So, a Joachim's Thaler would be the money that came from Joachim's Thal. So, there were silver mines in the town of Joachimsthal, and coins were minted from the silver first in 1518 in the town of Joachimsthal. Now, thalers actually became pretty popular in Europe. The Spanish real, or royal, was a unit of silver, a very small unit of silver, that was the basis of a currency in Spain during these the Middle Ages, and the most common representation of the Spanish real was a coin that was called a dollar or a peso. Did you know that dollar and peso are historically the same thing? Well, a dollar, a Spanish dollar, was actually a coin the size of eight reales, or pieces of eight. So, the dollar was originally a pieces of eight. Now, if you hear, heard the term pieces of eight, this coin that was eight reales in size of silver, it might make you think of a pirate raiding a ship and saying, Avast, me land lovers! Hand me all your pieces of eight. <laughs> and so this coin, the Spanish dollar or peso, equal to eight reales, these thalers spread throughout Europe. So why did these particular silver coins become so popular in Europe? Why, you might ask? Well, there is something about these. They had superior standards of minting. They were very close to being even in size, and they also had something that was intended to keep them from being diluted. And this was the milling around the edges. So, what is milling? Well, when a coin has milling, when a coin is milled, the coin has corrugated edges. You know, if you take out a quarter or a dime, you might recognize that it has these little, like, rough edges around it, kind of like a little tire. Do you know why these coins have these corrugated edges, other than to just feel kind of funny in your hand? Well, the idea, back when coins were made of real money, like gold or silver, there would be the temptation of someone to kind of use a knife or some kind of tool and scrape around the edges and then, you know, be able to take some of these clippings and fashion other coins. And so, this was a way of inflating the currency. 
And so to prevent that, coin, these Spanish dollars would have milled edges, which would signify an attempt to prevent coin clipping, to prevent scraping the smooth edges around the outside and using those to create new coins. And so this showed trust in the coins. If you saw those milled edges, you knew the coin was fully intact and wasn't tampered with to dilute so that you would be cheated out of your full thaler with a coin that had clipped edges. Now, of course, think about your dimes and your quarters. There's really no reason why anyone, unless they had this large industrial use for the metal, the diluted metal in our current quarters and dimes to want to clip them, but our quarters and dimes are milled probably for the historic reason that they originally were made from silver. History proves that coins, that money, that currency is trusted and reliable and has usage that lasts for a long time. If it is God's money, if it is based on precious metals and is shaped and measured such that you know what you're getting. And so point number two was that God measured the money. God created the shekel of the sanctuary to be a certain weight, and money is best when it represents a certain weight of a precious metal, like gold and silver. And now point number three, God stabilized the money. Let's go to Leviticus chapter 19 and verse 36. Now, I could have picked quite a few other verses to point this out, but these verses will hit home the point pretty well. Leviticus 19 and verse 36 says, Just balances, just weights, a just ephah, or measure of wheat, and a just hin shall you have. I am the Lord your God, which brought you out of the land of Egypt." And so, when God established the nation of Israel, God commanded them to use just balances and just weights. So, when people would make a trade during Bible times, and they determined that, say, an ounce of silver would buy a particular weight in wheat, they would bring out the scales and weigh the two sides of the exchange. They would use scales to determine and make sure that the correct amount of silver was being used on one side of the exchange and the correct amount of wheat was being used on the other side. And so in this way, you would have a stable economy with a stable currency. God indeed stabilized the money, providing a unit of money, the shekel of the sanctuary, which would be equivalent to 20 geras, a small weight, and it would be in silver. And so exchanging silver for wheat would be based on how much wheat would be grown. You might be able to purchase more wheat with your shekel as the economy prospered, but the shekel would always remain a certain weight of silver. Proverbs 11 and verse 1 says, A false balance is abomination to the Lord, but a just weight is his delight. Notice the word weight. Money is a weight in a useful good on the market that is used as a medium of exchange. And of course, just as the Bible recognizes, gold and silver form the best source of money because they fit all the criteria of money, as I mentioned in the last episode, and they have their own intrinsic value, their own utility. And so that was point number three. God stabilized the money. So one, God created the money. Two, God measured the money. Three, God stabilized the money. And now for our big point, number four, God punishes those who manipulate the money. Let's go to Isaiah chapter one 
and verses 22 through 23. Here the prophet Isaiah is prophesying God's judgment upon the nation of Israel in that they would be led captive if they didn't repent of their evil deeds. Now, what were some of their evil deeds? There were quite a few evil deeds going on in Israel, including idolatry, but here is one that God points out as an evil deed. Isaiah chapter 1, right from the beginning in verses 22 through 23, Thy silver is become dross, Thy wine mixed with water. Thy princes are rebellious and companions of thieves. Everyone loveth gifts and followeth after rewards. They judge not the fatherless, neither doth the cause of the widow come unto them. So, notice that a curse upon the nation is that valuable commodities become diluted. Does wine naturally become mixed with water? Or is that an indication of poverty? Trying to stretch out the quantity by diluting the quality. That's what these people were doing. And notice who are the thieves in this passage. The princes, the government, those in power, those with connections to the means to rob the poor. So this happens by diluting money. Notice that verse 22 says, Thy silver is become dross. And so the silver became diluted with less valuable substances. So this happens by diluting money so that goods and services become more expensive. And to whom do goods and services become more expensive when the money gets diluted? The poor, of course, those who are fatherless, those who are widows, as the passage mentioned, those on retirement, those who need care, those who are on fixed incomes, and those who have control of the money, who are able to turn the silver into dross, who are able to produce the wine and mix it with water, these are the ones These princes, they are rebellious and they are companions of thieves, according to the prophet Isaiah. So notice how Isaiah couples the idea of diluting money, manipulating money with thieves. Amos chapter 8 and verses 4 through 6. Here we have the prophet Amos, who was basically a farmer. Amos was kind of a country boy, but Amos nevertheless was still a powerful prophet in his message. And delivering the word of the Lord, Amos says in Amos 8 verses 4 through 6, Hear this, O ye that swallow up the needy, even to make the poor of the land to fail, saying, When will the new moon be gone, that we may sell corn, and the Sabbath, that we may set forth wheat, making the ephah small and the shekel great, and falsifying the balances by deceit, that we may buy the poor for silver, and the needy for a pair of shoes, yea, and sell the refuse of the wheat. So what is Amos saying? He's saying that these rich princes, these rich thieves who had a control and monopoly on the supply of money as well as some of these goods that the poor needed. And they they wanted to sell things to the poor. They didn't like the idea of Sabbath days or new moon festivals that the law ordained where people had to cease their commerce to focus on God and celebrate God's goodness. No, these people just could not wait for the Sabbaths and the festivals to be done so that they could get back to commerce. Why? Because they manipulated commerce so that they could rob the poor and make off like bandits. And notice what verse 5 said, making the ephah small. The ephah was a measure of wheat. It was a certain weight of wheat. So they would end up 
selling a little bit of wheat to the poor. But notice how they made the shekel great. So how can you make the shekel great if the shekel was a fixed weight of silver? It would always be the same thing, right? Well, if you manipulate the money and you dilute it, like the silver became dross in the Isaiah passage, and you would end up inflating the money supply, making a lot more of these silver coins circulate, but have diluted values of silver in there with dross in them, yet the poor would only have access to a relatively few number of them, and the princes would have a lot more because they manipulated the money. Then they could sell a little bit of wheat to the poor who are begging, and then the poor having to work so hard to cough up that little bit of silver to them, but that shekel is great to them. They had to work really hard to earn diluted money. Here's an example. If you recall the phrase, let them eat cake, this comes from allegedly Marie Antoinette. Queen Marie Antoinette, right before the French Revolution really kicked off, queen, the queen had insensitivity to the plight of the poor who were suffering from food inflation, and grain was becoming really scarce, and because they couldn't get bread to feed their hunger, they were starting to storm the Bastille to take over, and her reply and her grandiose living was, let them eat cake. Like, if they can't have bread, if they can't get grain, then just let them eat basically a more sweetened form of bread that came, that had ingredients in there rather than the grain that they needed. And so this was an insensitive remark, and it really showed her misunderstanding of the problem. And this was the effects of the French oligarchy manipulating the money supply to hurt the poor. Let's go to Micah chapter 6, verses 10 through 11. Quote, And there are yet the treasures of wickedness in the house of the wicked, and the scant measure that is abominable. Shall I count them pure with the wicked balances, and with the bag of deceitful weights? So notice what the prophet Micah is complaining about. It seems like all these prophets are complaining about the fact that these wicked rich people in power, in government, are hoarding the wealth. There's treasures of wickedness in the house of the wicked. Now, if you read the Proverbs, you'd see that there is praise for honest gain. God blessed King Solomon with riches. It wasn't wicked for Solomon to have riches as long as it was honest gain. Yet, if you acquire your wealth by dishonest gain, such as these people were doing, that there are treasures of wickedness in the house of the wicked, treasures of wickedness. And the scant measure that the poor would have, it's abominable. How did they attain these treasures of wickedness? According to verse 11, God is asking, Shall I count them pure or faultless with the wicked balances and with the bag of deceitful weights? And so, these people were acquiring their wealth once again by robbing the poor through the trickery of false balances. And so the poor were paying a lot more in their productivity to get a lot less from the wicked who were selling them and the poor were having to use manipulated money. So this was not by honest exchange. It was by false balances, manipulating the money. Let's go to Haggai chapter 1 verses 6 through 7. And this is great. Quote, Ye have sown much and bring in little. Ye eat, but ye have not enough. Ye drink, but ye are not filled with drink. Ye clothe you, but there is none warm. And he that earneth wages, earneth wages, to put it into a bag with holes. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Consider your ways. 
Now, God is pronouncing the curse upon the nation, but God seems to observe that the poor were suffering a plight caused by the rich. So they sowed much, but they brought in little. They ate, but barely. They drank, but not enough. They could barely keep themselves warm, and they would earn wages, but it was like putting their wages in a bag full of holes. So let's think, what would be the equivalent of earning money and having it fall out of a bag as if it, you know, you'd lose your money, you'd lose that, those earnings by having them fall out of holes from a bag? So what's the difference in your ability to purchase goods and services if you have, say, $10 in your wallet and someone were to steal $1 or $2? Let's say, okay, someone stole $2 of it. What's the difference between someone stealing $2 of it and you retain that value, those $8 left are able to purchase $8 worth of goods and services, or if you were able to keep the $10, but those $10 themselves were diluted and you could only purchase $8 worth of goods and services with it. It would be the same, right? So people are working hard, producing value for the economy, but they don't get to keep what they earn. They aren't getting the full fruits of their labor. So notice that the earnings are like putting money into a bag with holes. And what does God have to say about that? Consider your ways. So countries of the 21st century, nations of 2020, look at your monetary policy. Look at the whole idea of manipulated money running off printing presses inflation, diluting the value, and who gets hurt? The poor, the needy, the fatherless, the widows, those on fixed incomes. What does God say to the nation of Israel? Consider your ways. And so, what would God's message be to countries today? Consider your ways. Let's conclude point number four, that God punishes those who manipulate the money by looking at Exodus chapter 20, verses 15 through 17. You might know that Exodus chapter 20 is where the Ten Commandments are. You would be right, and we're going to look at three of those Ten Commandments. And these three in verses 15 through 17 are next to each other. Quote, Thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness or lie against thy neighbor, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass or donkey, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. So, don't steal, don't lie, and don't covet. The last three of the Ten Commandments seem to go well together. They are quite connected. And let's consider those who manipulate the value of money. They are guilty of all three of these final commandments on the Decalogue. They covet what they have not earned. And those who control the money supply, those who are able to dilute the value of money, appropriate to themselves a greater percentage of the wealth. Those who are connected with this process are able to get a greater proportion of what is really money. And so, if they covet what they have not earned, they lie about what they do with money by falsifying the balances. They use money that is diluted and less costly for them to produce to buy the real wealth of society, goods and services that people work to provide. They essentially steal from people by tricking them out of their wealth for a disadvantaged trade. And so, going in reverse order, the money manipulators covet what they don't earn, and they don't earn it because they are able to dilute or counterfeit real money. 
And so they lie about this. We have people who try to say that inflation or diluting the value of money is actually a good thing and that the economy grows. And so you want this to happen. And they don't let you know that people in government, people connected with banks that are closely connected with the creation of new money, printing new money, they get this money first and they are able to buy the things you work hard to produce or serve. And they can use money that was printed for them to do that. And so they get to obtain a part of the nation's wealth without having to earn it. So they covet and then they lie about it. And then they're actually, in effect, stealing away your wealth, the fruits of your labor, with money that doesn't have the value that they claim that it does. And so I'd like to leave you with this question. What is the difference between someone who counterfeits money, say, someone who is able to recreate U.S. dollar bills, and they're able to make them look just like U.S. dollar bills. And so they print them, and they spend them, and they're able to get some of the things that they want by printing them on paper that cost them a few cents to get, and they're able to buy thousands of dollars worth of things that they don't have to work to earn. They don't have to do a fair exchange on the market, and you're tricked into using these fake dollar bills. They look just like the real thing, but they weren't printed from the source. They were counterfeited. But what's the difference between what a counterfeiter does and, say, what the central bank does when it prints up the dollar bills, the real things? They can just print them up. They can use them to buy things from the economy. Isn't it really the same thing? Thank you for waking up with Truth Espresso. Good morning, and God bless your day. Hey friends, Daniel Minnick here again. If you liked waking up to this episode of Truth Espresso, I would really appreciate it if you would rate it on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or whatever application you use to listen to Truth Espresso. 